Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about cloud data warehouses and how things are changing. My name is Shane Johnson. I'm responsible for product marketing here at MariaDB, the open source database that everybody knows and loves. And I hope you'll come along this uh, short journey with me. So to start with some basic concepts and I imagine all of you are familiar with these, but you know, I think the little refresher here will make sense as we get a little bit farther along. For, you know, for a period of time, we generally just used general purpose data where databases for our data warehouses. Um, it's your Oracle database or SQL server or DB2. Uh, you have some instances for your transactional applications and you have some other instances for BI reporting and analytics. And these are row storage, right? What most databases are. And you're probably modeling your data is, you know, star and snowflake schemas. Um, that worked for a while, but, and we still see this today when people try to push it with general purpose databases, you can only go so far, right? Once you have too much data, uh, your queries are too complex, you know, it starts to slow down and become impractical. And so no surprise that led to more specialized data warehouses. Uh, and probably two distinguishing factors here. One is they tend to be column oriented, right? Using a columnar storage format, uh, meaning that they're storing data by column and not by row. And we get a lot of benefits from that. We get really high compression uh, because we're you know, accessing only those columns that are needed for a query from disk. We have much less disk IO and it tends to be really well suited for aggregates, uh, particularly if you have very large tables, but you're really trying to do analytics on a small number of those columns, um, which kind of leads to the next part, which is denormalization is fine in columnar databases. Uh, you're free if not encouraged to create tables with hundreds of columns, even if your queries are only touching one, two or three of those columns. The unimportant part is the massively parallel processing. Uh, it's important for data warehouses to be able to scale out because we're storing more and more data all the time. Um, gigabytes and terabytes and now petabytes. And it comes in two flavors together. Um, typically you're gonna run many instances, right? Depending on your performance and storage needs. And of course there's an assumption that each instance is also doing parallel query. Um, so that one query that comes from a client, it's not only spread out across many database instances but each of those instances also utilize multiple threads to execute with greater parallelism. And that gives you greater performance. Um, so I don't think there's anything new here, but it, you know, a little reminder of where we're talking about. And then a little bit about history. You know, early on we had the Teradators and then Tezas of the world. Um, hardware appliances, very expensive, proprietary. Uh, some of these vendors did transition you know, into the software approach. And then we also had kind of the next batch of proprietary software. You know, your HP Vertica's eventually sold off to MicroStrategy or Greenplum, which is fairly well known for a while, um, though not too long ago they did transition to open source as well. But beyond, you know, this appliance and proprietary software vendors, there wasn't a whole lot by way of open source to choose from. There was a couple smaller players, ClickHouse, MonetDB, uh, probably a few that I haven't even heard of, but there were no real leaders in the open source data warehousing space. And then the cloud comes along, uh, which is gonna be a big part of what we talk about here for a little while. Uh, Amazon Redshift, I think being the most notable, you know, one of the very first cloud data warehouses. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about Redshift in a minute, but you also have Google BigQuery, Azure SQL Data Warehouse, uh, and perfect timing, Snowflake. Right, we've all just witnessed the success that Snowflake is experiencing with data warehousing in the cloud. But let's spend a few minutes to think about Redshift. It was one of the earliest cloud data warehouses. It was great. Um, I think by and large, the cloud in and of itself, analytics was a great first use case for the cloud. Um, early on when people were still hesitant to move, you know, more of their 
customer facing or mission critical applications to the cloud, they were more comfortable doing analytics in the cloud. Um, stand up these data warehouses, load the data, um, do some degree of analytics, whether it's short term or long term. You know, there was comfort there and it worked well. And of course, as a managed service, it makes it very easy. Uh, you don't have to worry about the complexity of deploying a scalable data warehouse. Uh, a few clicks of a button and a few minutes later, and you're ready to start importing data. But, you know, fast forward to 2020, you know, let's take a look at how things have evolved since. And it starts, you know, I would say in 2005. Um, so yes, Redshift is GA in 2013, uh, but it's actually based on Postgres 8, which was released in 2005. Uh, Paracel comes along, they use Postgres 8 to build a data warehouse. Uh, and that technology is licensed by Amazon. And that's what they use to build Redshift. Um, Parcel, of course, would go on to be acquired by Actian. And Redshift, you know, to this day remains a proprietary solution. Uh, but probably what's most notable here is that, yes, you know, in 2013, it made it really easy and really fast to start doing analytics in the cloud. But in 2020, we're now missing a lot of features. Um, databases have continued to evolve. Uh, in the past 15 years, whether anyone realizes it or not, um, certainly in terms of SQL, you know, the syntax, the functions, schema, along with features and capabilities in the databases, different algorithms. Um, so a lot has been happening. Uh, and today, you know, that's what people are looking for. Um, the latest and greatest and to be able to do what's neat. So you look a little bit about Redshift architecture. Uh, we'll just kind of talk in basics here for a moment, but you have a leader node. And of course you have, you know, one or more compute nodes. Um, these are you know, running on EC2 and each of these has an attached disk, you know, an SSD for performance. And if you need more compute capacity or you need more storage capacity, you just add another one, you know, to the right and keep scaling out. And this architecture is really no different than an on-premises architecture, right? For those that might have been deploying, you know, Paracel on-premises or Vertica or Greenplum, um, this isn't going to look that too different for you, but it was adapted to run in the cloud, which is great. But a few things have changed along the way. Um, two of them that I want to talk about now, and a few of them I'll talk about in a few minutes here. Um, the first is more options from an open source data warehousing point of view. Um, and the biggest one there is going to be MariaDB Column Store. And MariaDB, um, one of the most popular open source you know, relational databases in the world. Uh, but not too long ago, we introduced MariaDB Column Store. Uh, for those that might not be familiar with it, MariaDB uh, builds on this notion of pluggable storage engines um, that these Storage engines um, in the more recent you know, versions we call smart engines uh, allow us to store and process data differently than a traditional database. Um, and that's what Column Store is. It's one of these smart engines. So it'll store data in a columnar format, just like you know, the data warehouses we talked about. And it is MPP, right? So it's fully distributed. Um, and it also does you know, pull parallel queries. So you can scale up and scale out, um, utilize as many cores as are available to you. And that started being taking off, you know, on premises. Um, customers who are now storing billions and billions of rows in ReadyB databases. And I'd say primarily for things like ad hoc queries, where you can't possibly create an index for every, every query that might happen. And for interactive analytics. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but um, is in stark contrast to make, you know, weekly or daily reporting. Um, interactive analytics, it does tend to be ad hoc. It could be customer facing. You want to be real time, uh, but we'll double down that in a second. And of course, the other big change was object storage. You know, this was popularized by Amazon S3. And again, you know, kind of circling back, I think Snowflake was one of the great examples of taking advantage of it early on uh, with this notion of separating storage from compute, allowing you to, you know, scale those independently of each other. Uh, but there's very good reasons to use object storage, you know, even beyond 
separation, um, first is it's much, much less expensive, um, especially in the cloud, but there's also cost savings available on private clouds as well. Um, but you know, what you pay for EBS is significantly more um, than what you could be paying for from S3. Um, but still object storage gives you, you know, the same high availability, the same durability uh, and also infinite capacity. Um, so it's not about picking the right instance size depending on how big you know, it's locally attached SSD is anymore. That becomes irrelevant. Um, object storage, you know, from an end user point of view, um, goes on forever, you know, and as you use more of it and you use more of it, that's great. But also I did add that little note um, that object storage popularized by S3, but it's also available on premises. So there's many um, both proprietary and open source object storage solutions available on-prem. And if they support the Amazon S3 API, which most of them do, uh, we can run ready to become store with object storage on a private cloud too. So a little bit about the architecture here. Um, one of the my things that you might notice is there's no more leader known, right? So this is kind of a, a fully distributed peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, shared nothing environment where we have one or more compute instances and those are simply ready to be with column store and they're all sharing one object storage. Um, so that's where all the data goes. And you know, here's three nodes, it could be four or five, six or seven, um, but they're all keeping their data remotely on object storage. And that gives you some pretty thing, neat things to do because if what you really want is more, you know, more performance, right? I need to do you know, more queries per second or I need more compute because my queries are becoming you know, increasingly complex. Um, add more instances on ReadyB with column store, you don't have to worry about the object storage underneath you know, because as we mentioned before, it has infinite capacity. But one more thing to note here um, is it isn't just as simple as each of these ReadyB instances keeping their data on object storage, um, but there is a great deal of parallelism within each one of these ReadyB instances. Um, so they open up many, many connections to Amazon 3 um, each of those threads is accessing a subset of the data, doing the computation in parallel. And then of course, all those results are aggregate and returned to your applications. But as I said before, there was two more things that I wanted to tease out because these are also gonna have a big impact on what we think about cloud and data warehousing and analytics is the focus on real time. Um, so certainly once upon a time, we had you know, a BI reporting you know, data analytics team. They had their own data warehouses. And typically data was moved you know, from our transactional sources into our data warehouses um, once in a while. Maybe it's every day, maybe it's once a week. Um, it varies. Typically for BI reporting, you, know, you might have a team of data analysts, maybe some data science. Um, they're doing work on that data, trying to extract you know, intelligence and value uh, and then maybe some of that is used to go back and update those original transactional databases. Um, some of these use cases early on, you know, one of the ones that I was a little bit closer to in my past uh, had to do with um, advertising. You know, so when you're browsing the web, you see those little ads embedded everywhere you go. Uh, they're of course trying to show you the most relevant ads for you. Um, so these companies tend to gather as much data as they can, you know, the websites you visited, what you've searched for, um, and then offline, they push that through you know, an analysis to basically bucket you into a profile. Um, so Shane likes science fiction. He lives in California. He watches football. He searches for technology. Um, based on interests, we're going to put him into this, you know, this profile category uh, that we can use to serve him the right ads, which worked. Uh, but there's the question of, of relevance and timeliness. Uh, these processes tend to be kind of once a week or more, but we're kind of shifting into an environment where we want the analytics to be based on the now, right? right? What is the most relevant ad to serve Shane right this moment? Uh, because yes, I do love science fiction, but maybe my interests over the past few days um, are pointing into a different direction, right? Something caught my attention and I'm spending a lot of time in this. Um, serving an ad that targets that's gonna be a lot more relevant um, than your knowledge of me watching football last year, which is starting to get out of date. And then there's also this notion of bringing historical and current data together. 
Um, typically, we think of our transactional systems as operating on current data. We think of our data warehouses as operating on historical data. Uh, but more and more, we need to bridge that gap. And that leads us a little bit into the next one, which is hybrid transactions and analytics, or HTAP, um, or HOPE. There's lots of different acronyms for it. Uh, but they're all describing the same scenario, which is, you know, those general customer facing transactional applications, the mission critical applications that, you know, just about every business runs today, right, in this new digital world, have to begin incorporating more analytics. Um, customers expect it, if not demand it. Um, and in a world where we're all competing online, we need to find ways to create differentiation or better experiences to keep those customers and to get more customers and to drive more revenue. So how we, can we begin enriching those applications? How we can begin giving them the same degree of analytics that the folks over in the BI teams already enjoy with their data warehouses? Um, how can we do that in such a way as to provide our customers with actual insight? Because in the same way that our bosses and our bosses' bosses want us to use analytics to give them information they can make better decisions with, so do all of us as customers, whether we're shopping online or paying bills or you know, engaging with you know, friends on social media, we're looking for more insight to also help us make better decisions you know, or uncover compelling opportunities, things that we might not otherwise um, have realized. And I'll talk about an example of that in a minute. And then these last two are a little bit more oriented towards just the you know, kind of the overhead and the complexity that we all find ourselves in when it comes to managing you know, data warehouses and databases and that infrastructure. Um, get a ring rid of ETL, right? Can we do without it? Um, can we set aside these processes of having to generate data marts every evening um, constantly so that we can get fresh data available uh, for an analytics? And we'll talk about there here is, is we can, right? And we should. So one of the things I wanted to circle back around to MariaDB is we talked about those smart engines. Um, so we have different engines. InnoDB is our general purpose engine, right? This is the equivalence of you know, Oracle and SQL Server and DB2. Um, this is why MariaDB is used just about everywhere for transactional processing. You can do both, right? So we can deploy MariaDB. It has InnoDB for transactional data and processing, and it has column store for columnar data and analytics. Um, our transactional data is gonna sit on locally attached SSDs because they're super fast and that's what we need to do transaction processing while our data for analytics is sitting on object storage because it's far less expensive. So we could bring those two together and we could have a deployment that could service the needs of lots of different applications. Um, the existing you know, customer facing applications for transactions um, dashboards and other types of internal applications for analytics, as well as kind of the newer generation of hybrid applications, right, or, or smart transactions, um, bringing those two together. So what does that look like? You know, from a very simple point of view, it just means that when a query comes to MariaDB, we can make a choice. If that's a transactional query, let's run it on InnoDB. If it's an analytical query, let's run it on Column Store. Fairly straightforward. We can also do some interesting things with joins. Uh, so you might have dimensions in ODB and then all of your facts in column store. And what we're doing here is we're not just combining row storage with columnar storage. We can combine replicated data with distributed data. And that can have some very strong benefits, first and foremost being that we can do away with distributed joins. Um, now those aren't uh, restricted, right? You can join column store tables to column store tables. Um, you can do those distributed joins. But if we had a small amount of dimension data, why not replicate it to every instance of MariaDB so that it's always local? And then we have a huge number of facts, we can distribute that, we can store that in Amazon S3, and then we can join those two together. Or, and this comes back a little bit to the hybrid example I was talking about earlier, Let's look at e-commerce. Um, clickstream data is probably a really good example of something we would want to put in column store. It's not really transactional by nature. Um, certainly there's a lot of it and the value comes from analyzing it. But then you think about your more transactional stuff, profiles, shopping carts, 
purchases, those are probably going to be an NODB. You know, those are your customer transactions. Um, so in the past, you know, we might have pushed that clickstream data, you know, those shopping carts and purchases, you know, all into data warehouses. And we asked those teams to do some modeling, right? Maybe we want to do a, a basket analysis um, to help us make better recommendations for our customers and visitors. Uh, but there's a delay there, right? Depending on how long does it take to get the clickstream data into a data warehouse? How long does it take to perform a market basket analysis? How long does it take to use those results and then update your transactional database? Um, every step of the way that adds more and more time makes those recommendations less and less effective and relevant. Uh, but if we can store both of those data sets, we can also join those. Um, so now in real time, if Shane comes to my website, you know, we have his profile, we know what's in his shopping cart, uh, we know what he's purchased in the past. Oh, and we can look at his clickstream events. What's he been searching for? What products has he looked at? Where's he spent the most time on? Um, are there related products? Now let's give him some recommendations that are accurate as of right now, you know, based on the most recent activity and knowledge of Shane. That's very powerful. Uh, when you can bring that degree of analytics into transactional applications and then improve the customer experience. The other thing that we see with customers is having current data in NODB and historical data in Column Store. So you might want three months of data in NODB. Um, it's certainly going to fit on the SSD. It's going to be very fast. Meanwhile, anything beyond three months is moved to Column Store uh, and available with analytics. And so we, you know, now is right about the time we can circle back to the cloud. Um, so we, we talked about what I think are some of the very big things happening in the cloud. We talked about object storage. We talked about open source. We talked about, you know, HTAP or bridging the gap between transactions and analytics, getting rid of ETL. SkySQL is MariaDB's answer and solution to these new requirements. Um, Self-explanatory, it is a cloud database as a service. In a sense, though, it's a little bit more like a combination of Redshift and RDS and Aurora. Uh, because with a single service, you can deploy any type of database, whether it's transactional, analytical, or hybrid, um, rather than using different services or different vendors. It's also built and supported by MariaDB. So those same engineers who built MariaDB, the database that everybody knows and loves, the same engineers that know best how to turn it into a DBS and know best how to support it for our customers. And it's designed to be cloud agnostic. Um, we don't have enough time to go into all the details, but hopefully there's a, a couple of goodies that are interesting here for everyone. You know, first and foremost, it runs on Kubernetes, right? That is the abstraction, um, not only above the different clouds, uh, but above public and private clouds, um, or being able to move to hybrid cloud. Uh, and there's some examples here, Google, Amazon, and Azure all have Kubernetes services available. And that's what we're using to deploy our databases. Equally important, you know, the portal, you know, where you log in and you, you know, check out your databases and your launch databases, you monitor them, that portal runs on ServiceNow. Um, ServiceNow is a leader in IT service management. Um, they are used by three quarters of the Fortune 500, almost half of the Global 2K. Um, chances are that your business is using ServiceNow already. Uh, and ServiceNow uses MariaDB. Um, so it was only natural as we built a DBS that we look to our partner to do that. Uh, but one of the things I really like about it is the independence or the neutrality. Um, so we talked with folks where um, some people are very committed to Amazon and AWS. That's where their expertise is. Um, that's where they're gonna run in the cloud. Other businesses, retail, transportation, uh, don't want to run on Amazon. Um, and even more so than that, they don't want any of their money going into Amazon. Um, so if we had our portal running on Amazon, but the databases were deployed to GKE, for example, um, some of that money still makes its way to Amazon. So ServiceNow is independent of these cloud service providers, yet it has its own data centers across the world, um, extreme degree of high availability and reliability. Um, so that's a little bit about SkySQL. And when you log into SkySQL, you see here what we were just talking about. Uh, which is that you can launch a database based on your workload or use case. Do you want transactions? Do you want analytics? Do you want both? 
Uh, and of course, more recently, we're introducing a distributed SQL option uh, for those requiring massive scale out, but that's a topic for another day. And a little bit more about you know, that architecture of Sky SQL, you know, as I mentioned before on the far left, that's where the portal runs. Um, and that's where our customers interact. Um, they can log into this web user interface. They can see you know, the inventory. That's your list of databases that are running. And then workflows. You know, when you want to launch a database or make a change to your database, these are often complex tasks, right? And they're assembled as workflows. Um, those tasks are then up executed in this control plane in the middle, right? So we kind of have an operations control plane where we take those incoming requests from that portal and we convert it into things like MariaDB commands and Kubernetes commands and you know, cloud infrastructure commands to, to make those changes to the databases, which on the right sit in their own single tenant private Kubernetes cluster. Um, so every Sky SQL customer has their own private cluster where databases are deployed. And that's for security, of course. Um, and that can be on any cloud. Uh, so right now it is Google Kubernetes engine. We're working on AWS with the Elastic Kubernetes service. Uh, and then of course, after that comes Azure's Kubernetes service. Um, so the Sky SQL portal remain the same, but these operations tier and the two Kubernetes clusters for your databases will simply be shifted into a different cloud platform. And finally, one last look when this is all deployed is we have multiple instances of MariaDB. If you want to do hybrid, um, they have InnoDB, they have Column Store. If we're using InnoDB, um, that's going to be on Google persistent disks or elastic block storage. Um, and then from an object storage point of view, that's going to be Google Cloud Storage, or as we've talked to you about a little bit here, Amazon S3. And then all of that is fronted by MariaDB MaxScale. And the great thing about MaxScale is that it abstracts away all of this infrastructure and complexity from applications and developers. Um, so to any developer out there, um, SkySQL will provide an IP and port, right? You have your user and your password, and that's all you need. Um, you don't have to worry about some data being row and some being columnar, some sitting on an SSD, some sitting on object storage. Um, all of that's hidden away for you, makes development a lot easier and a lot faster. And one last thing before we finish up here, um, for all those that are excited about the cloud and data warehousing and hopefully moving to you know, hybrid transactional analytical databases, um, everyone who signs up for SkySQL gets a $500 credit, uh, which is more than enough to stand up some databases and some data warehouses, give it a spin and try it out yourself. Well, with that said, thank you very much. Appreciate your time today.